everyone could find their seats, I'd like to call our meeting to order. Good morning. Happy New Year. Good morning. It is Thursday, January 12th, 2023, and I've got just after 9 a.m. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Lee County Tourist Development Council. Let's begin this morning by rising for the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll make you appreciate the name. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before you sit down, actually, uh, I'd like to, this morning, offer a moment of silence in honor of Tom Myers. Uh, Fran has served on our Tourist Development Council for years, and Tom and Fran actually are the owners of the Red Coconut RV Park on Fort Myers Beach. Uh, Tom uh, has always been a champion for tourism. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away uh, earlier uh, over, over the weekend. Uh, and so um, if, if you all will remember Fran and her family and your thoughts and prayers, and, and let's take a moment to uh, remember Tom and his life. Thank you very much. You may be seated. All right, let's please call the roll. Commissioner Brian Hammond. Present. Mayor Holly Smith. Here. Pamela Cronin. Here. Tony Laffey. Here. Jay Johnson. Here. Robert Wells. Here. Brian Kramer. Here. Bill Seinke. Here. Councilman Larry Kiesel. Here. We do have a quorum. Uh, excuse are Darla Baum, Joel Wachulis, Fran Myers, and Dan Allers. All right, thank you very much. All right, this morning we'd like to actually begin with a special presentation. Um, I want to recognize the commissioner who dedicated so much time and was a tireless champion for tourism last year as your chairman of the Tourist Development Council, our immediate past chairman, Commissioner Cecil Pendergrass. Commissioner Pendergrass, good morning. We're glad you're here. We have a, a gift that we would like to present to you. It is a plaque that recognizes your chairmanship of the Tourist Development Council for the year 2021 to 2022. And uh, say thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Commissioner Hammond, I just want to say thank you. And thank you to the group. You know, you guys have been an inspiration. You know, my 10 years of serving the board, I think this is my third time serving the TVC chair. And you're a wonderful group of people to work with. You know, we've been through it all. We've been through oil spills, red tide, COVID and now a hurricane. You know, it's just um, as we sit here and look around what's happened the last four months, it shows you how important life is. I was sat here next to Fran's empty chair this morning while she's not here and everything her and Tom has put in this. So thank you, Commissioner Hammond, for um, recognizing Tom and his loss. Um, but you know, we're going to come back stronger as a community. We've been through so much the last 10 years and we're going to come back better. So thank you again for everything. I really, really enjoyed. I never thought, you know, three, four months ago, me and Tamara and all our staff in turn were sitting in Germany promoting the beaches of Fort Margin of Sanibel. But at the same time, our house is being de devastated here. So you just never know what's going to happen. So I know we're going to come back bigger and stronger. So again, thank you for everything. Absolutely. Thanks, Commissioner. Can we take a picture? You're in good hands, too, though, Commissioner Hammond this year. So. Did, did we want to grab, yeah, the okay. official picture with the plaque? Tamara, come get a picture. Come get right a picture. Yeah. I can't yeah. it. You're the, you're the, the here we go, right here. The I got Andrew hiding down here. Look yeah. at her. <laughs> I'm not out of the picture. There we go. Can I thank you. Oh, sure. oh, thank oh, you. Okay. Yeah, one, two, three. <laughs> thank you. I got my Facebook friend Holly there. That's right. <laughs> thank, thank you again. Thank, 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 thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I truly believe when we, uh, when we uh, analyze everything, Commissioner Pendergrass will have presided over another record breaking year for tourism uh -oh. in uh, 21 22. So, thank, thank you very you. much. All right. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very good. At this time, we will take up the minutes of the previous TDC meeting from December. Um, I assume everyone's had an opportunity to review the minutes. Um, are there any comments or changes that need to be made towards the minutes, or would somebody like to make a motion for approval? Motion to approve. Okay. The motion for approval is from Mayor Smith, and the second is from Mr. Johnson. Do we have any discussion on that item at all? Okay, very good. Are there any objections then to the motion on the floor? Seeing no objections, that motion carries unanimously. At this time, we will hear from the folks who have come to speak in public comment this morning under our public to be heard section. Would you raise your hand if you come to talk in public comment this morning? 
All right, we'll recognize the folks from Art Fest. Please go to the podium and, uh, and share your comments. And if you would, begin by stating your name for the record. Good morning. My name is Katherine Kinsey. I am the executive director of Art Fest Fort Myers. On behalf of Art Fest team, uh, Megan Tremonte and Amy Crouch and our board of directors, um, we would like to thank you for all your continued support. We would also like to take this opportunity to unveil our 2023 poster. See you at the beach. Oh, wow. This commissioned piece from award-winning watercolor artist Ellen Nagley is a celebration of our beautiful beaches, <laughs> our Vanna White over here, our beautiful beaches and barrier islands recovering from Hurricane Ian's impact. It is a testament to the strength and depth of these communities that have pers persevered and continue to rebuild and recover. This year's poster has special meaning for me, actually. I grew up on Fort Myers Beach. I am a proud graduate of Beach Elementary School. So yes, quite a long time ago, but that's okay. Ellen's colorful and quirky style captures the perfect beach day from my childhood. So think at this time, well, excuse me, thank you for this opportunity. And at this time, we would like to present copies of the signed poster to Mayor Smith, Mayor Ellers, and a signed copy to the Tourist Development Council. Very good. Thank you very much for that gift. We want to we want to thank the folks at the Art Fest for those wonderful prints. That's that's a beautiful poster. It's absolutely inspiring to see that image uh, right now. I mean, just over a hundred days after the storm, it's a it's an inspiration and it, it gives you hope for what we can be again and will be again. So thank you all very much for that uh, inspiring gift. As any my gratitude, I'm very humbled. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for the gift to Sanibel. And also the mayor of Fort Myers Beach would have been here this morning. They do have a town council meeting this morning, but we'll make sure that he gets that as well. And I know they'd be uh, supremely grateful for the gesture. So thank you very much. Uh, has anyone else come to speak under public to be heard this morning? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to the municipalities to be heard. Uh, at this time, I, I know that Sanibel wishes to make a presentation, so I'll call on the city manager from Sanibel. Dana. Dana Souza. Good morning, Chair, uh, Committee Members, Mayor Smith. Um, thank you. I'm Dana Souza. I'm the City Manager in Sanibel. And I want to apologize up front if there's questions at the end. I forgot my hearing aids this morning. So if I say, can you repeat that? I, I apologize. Um, so the first image is one that many of you may have seen, you may, probably read about, but 
to our dismay, uh, the morning after the hurricane, we found that the, uh, the bridge had been breached, the causeway had been breached in five places. Um, we thought for months and months we would be without this access to our island, which is our umbilical cord, not just to Sanibel, but also to Captiva. And as we all know, the success story of this has been unprecedented. Um, I owe Steve Chapel in my office now a coffee for saying that word. Um, unprecedented in how that, that structure had been repaired and open to traffic by the state of Florida. Just unbelievable amount of, uh, amount of work. Um, so we're grateful to the state, but I also want to say to the county folks that are here how grateful we are for the relationship that we had throughout this event. Um, <clears throat> the daily conversations that we had with the staff level, and I know the mayor was engaged with elected officials as well, but Dave, uh, Roger Desjardins, obviously, uh, Dave Harner and I spoke daily, Glenn Salyer and I spoke daily, and then Steve Boutel, uh, who was the barge manager while the bridge was out, and we had, um, that's the only way that we were able to get equipment, uh, supplies over, and Steve did a phenomenal job making sure that our priorities, Captiva priorities, got on that barge every morning. <clears throat> Another image you may have seen uh, is the electricity was out for an extended period of time, and this is Sandcap Road on the way to Captiva with all the LCEC trucks and their mutual aid partners restoring electricity. Again, another effort by the governor. Uh, uh, the state stepped in, made sure that there was immediate access as soon as they could get trucks over the bridge um, onto Sanibel and Captiva so LCEC and their partners could begin uh, that work. And, and the state is also paying for much of that restoration as well. <clears throat> so debris. Um, this is the beautiful West Gulf Drive on Sanibel where there was a structure in the middle of the road or partial, the structure was just split. And I show these couple of images. I know that they're depressing in some ways. They remind us of what happened. But um, what we know in Sanibel is that the emotions that these slides might evoke of sadness and, uh, and as we look back on this event, that we do have a great outlook. <clears throat> we do know that we have come a long way since these days. This, these photos were taken on the 30th, two days after the storm, and that we may continue to make great progress every day. And Nelson Mandela said at one point in his life that it always seems impossible until it's done. Um, so as we go through these images, then we'll, get to, we'll turn the page on it. This is on East Gulf Drive where there was another structure on the road. And the reason that I show these particular images is because this is the road to the beach. And this is the road to where a lot of tourists come and spend their money and why they, they come and visit our beautiful area and come to our, our beautiful island. These slides I wanted to show because uh, what is on the left of the screen is before the storm. And what is on the right of the screen is after the storm. And it, can sh it shows how our coastline has changed, where the sand has been eroded, uh, where the storm surge, which was 12 to 15 feet in some places close to the, uh, to the shoreline, just devastated our coastline and our beaches. And as we move down, I could go throughout the 12 mile beaches, beach area of Sanibel, and you would say, see the same thing. And what I want to point to is these, what look like rivlets. Obviously, we have nice clean sand here. And you can see where all of the scouring happened on the beach. <clears throat> and as you zoom in on that, <clears throat> you can imagine what your walk on the beach or what our visitors walk on the beach would be like today. They still exist here uh, on our beach. And they're prominent as you go up and down our coastline. We also have had water from, from the stir, surge that is, we, uh, st continues to stay in place, um, <clears throat> that we have several little lakes that are between the upland structures and the beach area. Um, so significant, significant damage to Sanibel's beautiful beach. Back to the debris, I wanted to just show our latest update that we updated our community. Um, 
recently that we have exceeded 1.3 million cubic yards of debris collected to date. I remember being in this room for the, one of the first updates that the county commission received after the hurricane and the estimate for debris on Sanibel was 600,000 cubic yards of debris. And we're more than double that. We'll likely exceed 1.5 million uh, cubic yards of debris. The good news is that we are about 85 to 90 percent complete in removing the debris on the island. There's still a lot of, if you go up and down our roads, I know that the chair was, uh, was on our island last week and got to see firsthand some of the damage and really the, the steps forward our community has made, but we still have a bit of work to, to do. Our building permits are also uh, in, in flowing in now, and we're up to over, as of this morning, we're over 1,300 permits uh, that are in review. We have a new building official and deputy building official in our organization. We're turning around permits with, in review it doesn't mean they're all approved, but within five days, and then on a resubmission within three days. Now, planning takes a little longer with the, some of the complex issues around site plan, but this is really good work that, uh, that our staff is turning out. And we expect that to continue to increase as people begin their restoration. I, another big step forward is that I'm excited to say that next week our staff will return to City Hall. We have not been working at City Hall. We have been working at Crown Plaza Hotel. They just. Uh, we had to leave there last week. Uh, they had, had other obligations. Uh, the county has provided office space at the regional library and the meeting rooms that we've used for our reentry pass distribution, and we still have staff working there. Uh, and then our building and planning departments, we've leased space at 6200 Whiskey Creek Drive in Fort Myers, which is Hole Montez office in Fort Myers. Uh, and we have our, our staff that's there while we renovate space uh, uh, for those departments to be in a different building from City Hall. The lower level of City Hall was flooded, so natural resources and IT and a portion of the police department cannot return to City Hall. But our air quality test did not pass for quite some time. That mitigation... <coughs> traffic counts because one of the barriers that we had, if it was a barrier, one of the concerns that we had early on in the storm, we sent benchmarks in terms of when can, and we talked regularly with the county about these issues, when uh, could, what benchmarks did we have in place so we could eliminate the need for the reentry pass uh, for Sanibel and Captiva. And that was LCEC finished their work. The bridge on East Prairie Winkle Drive had been uh, also destroyed by the storm and FDOT uh, reconstructed that for us. Um, we had to have 80% uh, of our debris was our benchmark, and then we've had police security from other jurisdictions assisting us. So as soon as we uh, in, saw that we had a stable security force, the majority of debris was going to be cleaned up, LCEC wouldn't be impacted if there was additional traffic. Those were the benchmarks that we put in place. We hit those all by the end of December in City Council. Uh, said that we could open uh, the bridge for, without, for those without reentry passes uh, beginning January 2nd. Um, <clears throat> we still have a curfew from 9 uh, p.m. to 6 a.m., and City Council will evaluate that next week uh, when they, they meet. But the counts are important because these were two days in yellow when we had uh, FDOT had lane closures and our residents were concerned about delays in the bridge. But otherwise, the traffic has been moving smoothly. Uh, pr previously, through the checkpoint that we had set up, there were delays. Now, there are really no delays there. And the important part is that since January 2nd, our counts have not increased significantly at all. Uh, that really they stayed right around the average mark since before when the checkpoint was in place and the reentry pass required. So the I show this because our residents were very concerned about what impact would be on the island if we dropped the requirement for those passes. Typically in January, we, we would be seeing about 11,000 cars a day coming over the causeway. So beach parks, including the Sanibel Lighthouse, which is beautifully depicted in this uh, pa uh, painting, um, <clears throat> is closed and the beach is not open to visitors. We're not stopping people from going there. They can mainly arrive from boat, but our, bo our beach access, our beach parks and access points are closed to the public. The fishing pier and the boat ramp are closed and the city's shared use path 
you can't really use it throughout the system and we discar are discouraging people from using that at this point because debris is still coming out. We're estimating our lost revenue from the beach parking fund at this point to be about $3 million. That's a, uh, estimated to be about 1.5 quarters of the annual revenue that, that we would typically see uh, from beach parking revenue, which is uh, just under $8 million that we projected for this fiscal year. <clears throat> and this image also is one that really can tell the story pretty quickly in terms of how the damage uh, on Sanibel occurred. Our, our lighthouse cottages, our keeper's cottages are gone and the, the, the lighthouse um, is missing a leg. We think that the leg was taken out when the cottages washed away. At our community update this week, um, we did have good news from our building official that he is now working with LCEC to make the final connections necessary to turn the light back on, which will be a big event for us. Um, I coined the phrase, I think we have some t-shirts that we've made, shine on Sanibel. Mm. Um, Sanibel Strong has been used, uh, Southwest Florida Strong, Fort Myers Beach Strong, and we thought that maybe it's time that we thought of something that would be a little different and represent Sanibel, and shine on Sanibel is the uh, phrase, and I think that will be a, a good um, slogan for us to use in the future. Our goal for reopening beaches is that we are hoping to have two beaches, beach parks open by early February, in early February, it will not be before that. And those two that we're looking at would be Tarpon Bay Road, which is uh, supported by the Trost parking lot, and also Blind Pass, which has limited parking space. And because the uh, Turner Beach Park is closed, and that's where the restroom facilities existed, people could walk across the, the, car, the, the bridge to get there. We'll have porta toilets at that location, and also at Trost, uh, so our customers can use that. What's happened is that we've had, a, had to complete large debris rem removal. Our contract at Crowder Gulf has wrapped that up this week. Uh, they are going back in today to d take some additional uh, debris out of Bowman's Beach area while the bridge, the footbridge is being reconstructed. Uh, TDC helped fund a project that was underway when the hurricane hit and the contractor lost the majority of the materials. It's been recovered and, and that contractor is working again, but we didn't want the debris that is between the dune and where the bridge lands on the Gulf side to be a problem, so con uh, the contractor is going in to take that out. Uh, Lee County had offered to rake our beaches. You, you probably know Sanibel doesn't typically use a rake on the beach, um, but we couldn't do it because of the amount of large debris that we had on the island. Uh, our natural resources director is reaching out to Parks and Recreation this week to say we are ready for the beach rake to come in if it's still available and we'll have it deployed to test at uh, Tarpon Bay and then at Blind Pass so those beach areas can be clean. We also have an army of volunteers who are out there every week picking up debris and collecting it um, so that job would be smoother and that's coordinated through our Natural Resources Department, Recreation Department, and SCCF, Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, who's going to continue these, these volunteer um, beach cleanups weekly after the beaches start to uh, reopen. One of the other challenges that we have, if you've been to our beaches, you know that the access is done through a dune walkover. Uh, we've had several meetings with DEP now, and we have the okay to create at-grade pedestrian access areas until we can get dune uh, uh, walkovers reconstructed and whether or not we, we will do that in the future. We've had some lessons learned from this storm that have taught us about dune walkovers and, and maybe we won't deploy them in all areas that we have in the past, but uh, great work with DEP to help us get at-grade uh, pedestrian access points constructed. And then you saw those uh, I call them ravines because some of those are deep. They're six feet, nine feet deep in some places. They're scouring that we can see on our beach. So we will put up some temporary fencing where we need to near our beach access areas to ensure that the public is safe. We also have some other uh, beach access, access locations that have resident or A and B sticker parking only. And those do not have big parking lots, only a couple of spaces, but those who are nearby uh, can walk to those. We'll be working to open some of those up in February as well. 
when we return uh, and our beach parking uh, in Sanibel has been paid for through pay stations that have been in the parking lot, those are gone. And we were going to begin the transition to a pay app uh, this fiscal year anyway. So we will be uh, deploying the T2 mobile pay uh, app. Our police department is in charge of that project. We'll be doing the beta testing on Jan uh, starting the 16th next week. So it'll be ready to use on February when we get some uh, beach park areas open. To talk about long-term recovery, Obviously, um, this, this is not, these are from our legislative priorities. Uh, I've taken out those that are not really related to this group's interest. But Renera Sanibel Beaches, we've estimated that the cost will be about $30 million. And we know that during the special legislative session, $150 million was provided by the state. And we will be looking, I spoke with our lobbyists this morning, uh, we're waiting for the application package to come out so we can uh, be one of the first in lines to apply for uh, beach nourishment on Sanibel. We also see that the, the repair of the, do, of the walkovers and restrooms, uh, I also wanna go back to the first bullet because the dunes are so important in our, uh, on Sanibel as a barrier to uh, storm surge to protect us from storm surge. And a lot of those were wiped out, uh, flattened by the storm surge. So how do we reconstruct those as well is, is uh, an important part of our work. We have finished our engine, our engineer, coastal engineer has finished the profile or the assessment of those beach and to compare with, we do that annually to compare with the measurements that were completed last year. So the beaches, the dune walkovers and the restroom repairs, again, the walkovers and restroom repairs are funding that has generally come from TDC and we have funding this year for some of the bathroom renovations. Um, we'll, we'll, we will be able to get them reopened, but there will be some long-term uh, funding that we'll be seeking. Um, <clears throat> and then repair the shared use path, which is critical as part of our transportation network in season when we have a lot of cars driving in, into town. Visitors and our residents can bike to the beaches, bike to all parts of, of our community and businesses, restaurants. So that is, there is some damage that has been uh, inflicted, some from the storm and some from the cleanup efforts that have happened. So we estimate that about $2 million will be needed to restore our 26 miles of shared use path system. And that's all I have for you, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions. Very good. Uh, council members, do we have any questions at all? Mr. Wells. On the restrooms, do you, uh... Can you insure those beach restrooms or are they uh, uninsurable based on the location? Um, they're not insurable. Okay, thank you. And whether, in, I think that if we tried to insure them after this event, we'd pay a pretty high premium. We did have um, you know, a significant damage and, and other beach structures that we lost in addition to the cottages where our maintenance shed at Lighthouse Beach Park and then there was an old uh, restroom facility, beach restroom facility at Algiers that was used for, converted into affordable housing, and that structure is no, no longer available. So, Very good. yes, ma'am. Well, yeah, you have follow up or? Yeah. Uh, this may be just a best practices for all Overly County, and, and, and I'm sure y'all are facing it. Um, what I've noticed is you'll have the cleanup crews come through and then three days later, somebody gets back to their house and they take everything that's inside their house and put it on the curb. And then it sits there for weeks. It's happening all over Lee County. It's really unsightly. <clears throat> Have you guys figured out some way to address that or to notify residents that, hey, this is gonna be the last pickup and anything else going out is gonna be on you to, to remove? Yes, yeah, so uh, we'll talk with council on next week about what our date will be that we'll be asking residents to have their debris out for that sort of last push. Um, and that's typical of any event that I've been involved in, which unfortunately is a number of them in terms of how the debris is picked up, um, that you have these waves of debris that come out. But in this in instance where, you know, Hurricane uh, Charlie, uh, Hurricane Irma in Sanibel were primarily vegetative debris issues, this is all C and D, the majority of it is C and D. And, what we, I, I helped some residents who came to City Hall this week, and so we're seeing the next wave of residents who might have come back to view their property after the storm, 
and do some initial but buttoning up, but now they're back. And so we have now yet another push of C&D coming out. That's the cycle. Thankfully, we have enough trucks on the island that are managing that debris. Uh, and I'll just to bore you with the details of that. Initially, we prioritized the entranceways to our city, Periwinkle, the Causeway Road, and other main roads. And then we asked the contractor to let the debris pile up on those and take them off where we have safety issues or visibility issues and get into the neighborhood so we could provide relief to the residents who are trying to restore their homes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Director Pigott. So, you know, the restroom at the lighthouse closest to the lighthouse, I know we, when we built that one, we had a lot of hurricane structure thought. And I saw some images. It looks like that one made it. I don't know that it is functioning, but I think the structure still stands. And can you repeat which structure again? I'm sorry. It, oh, oh, that's my... My apology. <laughs> I thought my mic was on, and I'm a little hoarse, too. It's not you. Um, the the restroom closest to the lighthouse. I, I remember when we worked on that project, that was a, a TDC funded project, but a long process because of the lease from the federal government, et cetera. Um, I believe that one really had a lot of hurricane reinforcement in it. And it looks like from some images I've seen that restroom still stands. It, does still stand. it might be our, our um, example <laughs> for how we want to you know, proceed with those projects going forward because it looks like it may have. The restrooms at other facilities still stand too. They just need renovations and reinvestment in, in those projects and our staff is prioritizing those. When we go to council next week, we will have uh, sort of a, a green light on those facilities that we think we can, re we can reopen in a short term frame a yellow light that would be mid-range, and then a red light on those that'll be long-range. Lighthouse, uh, Lighthouse Beach Park will probably be one of the last ones because of the scouring and the erosion that we have, unless we can get a sand haul in there, um, any s excess sand that we might recover from other locations where the sifting operation is going to start this week, uh, we'll try to put back at Lighthouse Park so we can restore that. I mean, I could even see that it's already recovered a little bit. On my first visit out there, the one of the the uh, houses, the, the I should say the foundation, obviously they're gone, but it was literally in the water, which of course it was not previously in the water. So I know that you know it's just, it's a significant uh, erosion there at that yes. location. You lost part of the road there. I mean, there's a lot of work to do. We recognize that. And let's pray we don't have a lot of winter storms this year because winter storms are the time that we do see some erosion that would generally happen uh, as they pass through here. Thank you so much. Thank Any you. Any further questions, Council? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Souza, Dana, wow. Thank you very much for the great presentation and thank you for all the hard work, Mayor, that you, your City Council, your your city administration that all of you are doing to serve your residents and serve ultimately our county. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, we're here with you. We support you. And uh, let's uh, let's rebuild this thing together. We know we know it's going to be the Sanibel that we've always remembered, and, and it's going to be even better when we get it get it put back together. So thank you. Very good. All right. At this time, I'd like to um, recognize Director Pigott for the report of the Executive Director. Mm -mm. Oh, I apologize. Did any other municipalities come to be heard this morning? Maybe not, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah, don't see any of them. Okay, okay very good. Sorry about that. I no, just want to make sure. No worries. Thank you for I keeping me. I see some me. faces that I know are from the municipalities, but they might not have any, any presentations this yeah. morning. November bed tax collection. Well, first of all, Happy New Year, Council. Uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and work with you in 2023. Uh, November bed tax collection, uh, just under 2.4 million uh, compared to this period last year. That's a decline of 40.3%. Uh, and uh, for the fiscal year and recognizing that that's only two months of collection, 4.6 million uh, down 38%. Star report, uh, the occupancy is came in at 82.6%. That is an increase, but recognize that you have a decrease in the number of rooms available. So there's some compression in the rooms available. 
uh, does not mean there were, you know, you see the bed tax numbers, the, the, the alignment is correct. It's just that of the existing rooms, there is an increase in occupancy. ADR up as well and RevPAR up, uh, obviously, with the other two up. In terms of the key data report, um, the way key data collects their data is they do data scraping. It, it appears that most of our vacation rentals have their listing active, um, unavailable, but active. So it probably is more reflective of uh, available, uh, tr true um, quantity of properties versus actual occupancy in the total number of properties but many of those properties have been taken offline. They're just X'd out through the, you know, through the end of the year or through, through the summertime period. I know, you know, like everyone else, lots of repairs and, and things are going on. Um, uh, so this number, while, I, you know, I wish it was a more accurate number, we're working very closely with them to try to figure out how we get our arms around which units are truly available versus their listing still, you know, listed on Verbo or Airbnb. So um, that is that information. At the airport in November, a, a decline of 17.7 percent, just over 800,000 uh, passengers through the airport. And for the calendar year through November, uh, 8. Point, almost 8.5 million, which is an increase over 2021, I suspect they will end the calendar year with a, a, you know, a plus over. We know that we were having a very good calendar year uh, up to the point of the storm. So um, that probably will be a record breaking year for them as well. With that, I would like to ask Ray Siracino to come up and give us the communications report. Morning, Council. Morning. I'm Ray Saracino from Communications Department. Um, for starters, just want to talk about impressions, overall impressions. Uh, low October, uh, things started looking up much more in December. Slide over to coverage. Now, one of the things was we responded to dozens of queries from national and international media in the aftermath. and. At the same time, we also hosted a senior travel writer from the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which is in our market, and uh, <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Wells, for hosting her as well as everyone. Uh, very good visit. And also thanks to the efforts of my colleague, Jackie Parker, we had an excellent mention on Tampa Bay's Great Day Live. Uh, really good plug for the drive market. Now, immediately after the storm, we brainstormed to try to come up with products, projects, and ideas that we could use and utilize effectively, efficiently, and quickly. Uh, one of these was the Road to Recovery videos felt we wanted to tell the story in a short video form to let people know this is what our resiliency looks like, this is what our situation is. Kudos to my colleague Miriam Dotson who worked really hard, uh, basically got eight of these out in a very short order. Uh, there is a uh, QR code if you'd like to watch them all, they're all together. I can share that with you later if you're interested. And these weren't only well received uh, locally, uh, a lot of positive feedback from our partners, the people we focused on, but there was also a, uh, one of them was watched by someone at Good Morning America who actually turned it into a, to, into a piece that uh, talks about Krista Kowalczyk, who is from Impressions Photography and who did a really bang up job if you watch the video, trying to help people recover lost photos, documents, things like that. They did a piece on her and it was really also well received. Okay, we also bumped up our frequency for our industry partner newsletter, which we're back to our cycle of once a month, but immediately after we felt that we needed to get as much information out as quickly as possible. So we bumped that up through the end of the year of 2022 to uh, once a week. So that was also a very, uh, very hard work on my staff's part and um, glad we got that out. 
And one more of our products that we put out, goal is weekly, um, is what to do. And what to do is uh, a listing that's put together by our team that uh, lets people know what's going on. It goes out to the partners every week. And uh, if you're interested, again, please let me know. We can get you on the list. Make sure you have, a, have that. That's once a week. And heading into press trips, uh, as I mentioned, Susan Glazer came over from the Cleveland Plain Dealer, did six stories, and uh, really scoured the area, did a very thorough and good job on that. Here she is at uh, Margaritaville talking to uh, David Cesario, who's the GM there, and uh, really got a good overview of what's on the ground here. And I know it's a little bit into the first of the year, but I want to include Ike Knall from Radio Frankfurt. He has a large <laughs> listening audience in Germany, and of course that's a target market as well. Uh, very, very good day. Uh, again, thank you, Mr. Wells, for coming out, as well as uh, the support we received from the Luminary. They gave us a room to work from, and it was a very successful day. And speaking of Germany, one of our German contractors uh, was on a familiarization tour with one of my our colleague here, Jackie Parker, got a chance to look at Cape Coral and visit a number of sites that she hopefully will, not hopefully, will go back and talk to, uh, to her customers about and let people know that we're open and that things are available to do here. And on Shellcast, again, uh, we focused the last quarter uh, on recovery efforts uh, so each of those podcasts was focusing on a different subject involving recovery. Uh, we're now going to go back to telling people about just the general interest about the area, but looking forward to those. And I am very happy to announce that we, uh, if you remember, uh, before the storm, we were going to launch Industry Partner Spotlight which is a monthly video series focusing on an industry partner, a short video just talking about somebody we do business with, letting people know about what, they, what services or products they offer and you know, how we work with them. So I'm very happy to say that this is our next current industry partner spotlight video for your consideration. <laughs> Well, it was a corner store before. That was in the 70s, 80s, and then it turned into the perfect cup. Uh, Whitney Brown was one of the previous owners. He sold it to Rich and Rachel. Uh, February of 2021, they moved down from Minnesota. They opened it up and gave it a ton of love, had one of their artist friends come in and do all the artwork here, and just took it by the reins and, and ran with the, the town that they love. We love our community, especially because the moment we were started, we had water, we had free coffee out there for people to get them going and, and step through. Uh, Rich and Rachel have worked really hard with the community to give donations and help out those that are struggling. Uh, we're doing all of our coffee orders, so we're working on getting that up online so that we can do online coffee orders for those that don't permanently live in our area and want to send our delicious coffee to other areas. Uh, possibly do a little bit later lunch. We'll see what happens with the area and support our other restaurants that are trying to open. And again, we're hoping to have a frequency of once a month on those. Um, we're open to any ideas. We've had a lot of response already. Um, so we're, our dance card's filling quickly, but uh, we're very happy to do that. Really, uh, really appreciate the cooperation and, uh, from our partners. And finally, we have a busy upcoming uh, schedule. Um, we have our NJF is our contractor in New York who works with public relations for us in communication. They're going to be down here January 31st through February 3rd. Uh, we're going to show them around. And again, the idea is uh, to be able to communicate effectively what's on the ground here, what's available, and encourage media to come down here and report on it. Uh, currently, we have two senior writers, outdoor writers from uh, Victor Block and Phyllis Hawkman, uh, who have a very large following in the senior community. They're out today, in fact, at Captiva Cruises for the grand reopening. Uh, we're putting together a UK update video for UK media, and we will also have a video press conference. Uh, the idea being we'll have travel uh, writers from the UK be able to talk to us directly online and uh, report on what they see here. March spring training fam, and bringing up the rear here lastly is uh, USA Today writer Wendy Pramick. Now she is going to be here to report on volunteerism, to talk about people who are coming to the area maybe for a mix of holiday, uh, vacation time and uh, also a chance to help out a little bit. Um, so we're, we're pushing hard on that and looking forward to see what the results are going to be. So pending that, uh, any questions? That's my report.
Good. Council, any questions? All right. Thank you, Ray. Alex. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Jill Vance to give us an update on the sales report. And I think uh, Charm is going to, Charm Evans will join her to talk a little bit about international. Good morning, Council. I'm Jill Vance, Director of Sales. And before I go over our sales activities, I just want to honor our VCB team members who worked at the Emergency Operations Center after Hurricane Ian. They were there for over a month, and in that time, they booked over 6,000 room nights at our open hotels for recovery workers. And they're not all here right now, but I still want to thank Pam Brown, Jennifer Walla, Charm Evans, Annie Banyan, Benicia Toiloy, and Ray Saraceno for their part in helping our community. <clears throat> of our first quarter results for our new fiscal year sales goals. And please know that it was no easy task determining what these goals should be following Hurricane Ian. Similar to COVID, once again, we find ourselves in uncharted territory. However, I have confidence in our VCB sales team, so I have based some of these goals on 2019 pre-COVID numbers. We're off to a great start with meeting leads. As you can see, we are ahead of pace. We're on pace for the number of site attendees to the destination and for destination educations, which include client events this year. We are behind pace for wedding leads sent, but our marketing team is reactivating our wedding media and an increase in new wedding leads will come shortly. And finally, we are tracking our community engagement uh, this year. It is new. Uh, we are doing this in conjunction with our strategic plan objectives. So. The Monday following Hurricane Ian's landfall, I began to get frantic emails and phone calls from meeting planners concerned about their 2023 conferences already booked at our hotels. To help meeting planners understand that not all areas were affected the same by the storm, and since seeing is believing, our PR director Ray and I went out and we shot some timestamp videos. Brian showed one of these videos in his presentation last month, and here's another one. Hello everyone, I'm Jill Vance, Director of Sales with the Fort Myers Islands, Beaches and Neighborhoods Visitor and Convention Bureau. And it's been well over a month since Hurricane Ian came ashore, which had far reaching effects on our barrier island communities. However, many of our inland neighborhoods were less affected by the storm. For instance, I'm here at the Holiday Inn, Fort Myers Airport at Town Center, which is in the Southeast portion of Fort Myers and most of the businesses here are up and running. As you will see, recovery efforts have moved very quickly. For instance, the 169 room award-winning Holiday Inn Fort Myers Airport at Town Center officially reopened its doors on November 1st. Also, their Oasis restaurant is open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and features an indoor-outdoor poolside bar with a lakefront patio and a fire pit where you can enjoy tacos and tequila night with live music every Friday. Not only has the Holiday Inn fully recovered from the storm, they are just finishing up a $2 million ground floor renovation, including all meeting space, an expanded fitness center, and even a new 24-hour marketplace. Once everything is completed, they will be rebranding to a premium brand within the IHG family that caters to modern business travelers, allowing them to blend work with relaxation. You may be thinking, when I bring my group here, what is there to do in this area? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Right next door is Gulf Coast Town Center offering a wide variety of restaurants. Also close by is Miramar Outlets, home to over 140 top designer outlet shops, or Top Golf, which is a great entertainment venue and perfect for team building events. Just down the street is Hertz Arena, offering a wide variety of entertainment from big name concerts to the Florida Everblades hockey games. You can also enjoy spring training game for the Minnesota Twins or the Boston Red Sox at one of our nearby state-of-the-art stadiums or treat your group to some ecotherapy on a wet walk and see up close wildlife unique to Southwest Florida in their natural habitat at the Six Mile Cypress Slough Preserve. 
Although our landscape may look a bit different, you can still feel the warm breeze on your skin and witness the breathtaking colors of the Gulf sky at sunset. The way our nature makes you feel has not changed. So many people continue to ask us, how can we help? And we're so touched by the outpouring of love and support that we've received. One of the most beneficial ways to help our community is to continue to hold and attend future meetings in our area. This will help in the economic recovery of our community and keep our hardworking hospitality workforce employed. Although we still have work to do, things will continue to improve. Please know we value your business and are so grateful to be able to welcome you to the Fort Myers area. Okay, so the purpose of these videos was twofold. One was to save existing conference business and two, to entice meeting planners to book new conferences for the future. And it worked, and I'll give you an example of each. So this is an email blast sent to thousands of fishing industry association members by the president of the National Professional Anglers Association. He was concerned about the attendance for his annual event and that was booked at the Holiday Inn, and he seemed to be kind of on the fence as to whether he wanted to move forward or not. Once we sent him this video that you just saw, he then sent it in this email blast, and it reads, Fort Myers is open for business. The annual conference is a go in Fort Myers. And then below is a link for folks to register. Not only did they reach their attendance goal, NPAA also made a donation to help support fishing guides in our area. My next example is from an email from the manager of the Florida Attractions Association who is looking for a location for his 2023 annual conference. He says, it is no secret that we had an incredible experience at the Luminary Hotel in August of 2021 and certainly wanted to return for a future conference in a few years or so. We typically do not return to a former area that has hosted our conference so soon, but we felt that under the present circumstances, we would like to demonstrate our support to the Fort Myers tourism community and our partners. So FAA did book this event that's coming up this June at the Luminary in Fort Myers. And I just wanna say that our meeting planners are amazing. And this is why strong client relationships are priceless. All right, sales activities. Um, sales activities for last quarter. Since the Luminary had already reopened and many of our other meeting hotels were planning on reopening by November, we decided not to pause any of our meeting planner show attendance since sales is all about relationships. We felt it was important to get the accurate information out there and not take a chance on letting the news reports tell our story. So on October 9th, Jerry did just that at the IMAX America show in Las Vegas. This show is the largest hosted buyer show in North America and attracted over 4,000 qualified meeting planners. Once again, we were in the Visit Florida booth, whose location is front and center upon entrance to the exhibit hall. And this generates a lot of walk-up business in addition to our pre-scheduled appointments. Here's some upcoming activities for the domestic sales team. And for January, I just wanna point out that even as we speak, Betsy is attending the PCMA Convening Leaders Conference, which is a hosted buyer event with over 4,500 attendees and a multitude of networking opportunities. And in February, I just wanna point out one, Aaron will be attending the Visit Florida, Florida Encounter Show. This is Florida's premier hotel planner, hosted planner trade show, and there are typically about 200 meeting planners in attendance. Aaron will meet one-on-one -on -one with these qualified meeting planners who have business in Florida. And finally, for March, Conference Direct is having their annual partners meeting and Aaron will be attending this three-day reverse trade show with one of our co-op hotel partners. For those of you who don't know, Conference Direct is a third party with over 400 meeting planners who own over 4,400 accounts, and we consistently get good results from this show. Are there any questions before I turn it over to Charm Evans, who will update you on our international activities?
Good morning, Charm Evans, VCB Global Sales Manager, reporting on the October through December international sales activities. Since the storm, we have been focused on communicating and educating our in-market vendors, as well as the travel trade and the consumers on the status of the destination. This has included conducting webinar trainings, attending travel trade and networking events, as well as partnering on marketing activities, such as the October Discover America Roadshow to Stockholm or Gothenburg in Malmo over a period of three days. Travel Life Magazine in Canada also provided us with a complimentary full page ad in their quarterly luxury publication that focuses on unique and cultural experiences that one can still have in the destination. The publishers wanted to show their support for our area as they have a deep connection here. Also, Jeanette Faria attended the Society for Incentive Travel Excellence, or SITE, in Toronto to continue sharing the message and providing an update on what businesses are open in the area. This month, we are looking forward to attending the Eurowings Discover Roadshow, taking place in five cities, where we will continue networking and providing a destination update. This is an important partnership between the VCB the Port Authority in Eurowings, where we partner with uh, the Port Authority to uh, increase demand for the RSW flights through our uh, sales and marketing uh, efforts. We will also be participating in Visit Florida's Florida Huddle taking place the first week of February, conducting one-on-one -on -one appointments with the international and receptive tour operators. And finally, ITB will be taking place in Berlin, Germany in March, and it is one of the largest global B2B uh, travel trade shows. And this will be the first, um, since 2019, this will be the first time that this event will be happening in person and will be there to meet individually with the international um, travel trade and media. That concludes my report. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jill and Charm, for that update. With that, sir, that concludes my report or my, t oh, wait a minute. No, Simone. I'm sorry, Simone. Gosh, I'm rushing things, aren't I? I'm, I'm, I'll be really quick. No, you don't have to be really quick. <laughs> sorry, Simone. No, my goodness, goodness, not at all. Good morning, Council. I'm so happy to be here with you this morning, and it's my pleasure to report to you on Visitor Services update for the, uh, the last quarter. Um, during the time period from October through December, you can see uh, how many visitors we assisted and all of our stats there. I do want to draw your attention to the calendar year to date numbers. Um, for last year, our volunteers assisted 344,890 uh, visitors, which is actually a record for us. Uh, we, uh, they worked 23,335 volunteer hours which is a value of $684,588 to the county. We gave out uh, 48,828 visitor guides and sent 7,200 brochures to the Visit uh, Florida Welcome Centers. The top request during that time period for accommodations was the Crown Plaza, Home Two Suites Airport, as well as the Residence Inn at the airport. Top attractions were the Edison and Fort Winter Estates, the IMACT History and Science Center, as well as Six Mile Cypress Slough Preserve. Top activities were shopping, festivals, and golfing. Visitor services staff and volunteers uh, were involved in various community and partner support uh, events during that time period. Uh, we, uh, as uh, Jill mentioned, uh, we were also involved with uh, emergency roles. Uh, Benicia just actually returned to our office uh, this week after three and a half months at the EOC. Volunteers donated items for hurricane relief to the Fort Myers Beach Kiwanis Club. We assisted with the Fort Myers Tip-Off Classic Basketball Tournament. Uh, we donated toys to the children at Lutheran Services. Right before the holidays in Santa Dolphin, made an appearance at RSW, um, really making a lot of arriving passengers uh, very happy to celebrate uh, the season. 
Now, there's nothing like the power of a cookie. We did have to roll out uh, Project Cookie uh, last month uh, with some uh, flight delays and cancellation at RSW. And even though we can't fix things, uh, it does help to diffuse a lot of the stress and um, how can you be upset with you know, our wonderful volunteers handing out cookies. So it, it did help a little bit, I think. Uh, last month, we're always also were able to celebrate our volunteers at our annual um, holiday uh, gathering, which took place at Buckingham Farms, and it was a lot of fun. Looking ahead, uh, volunteer early morning and uh, evening a.m., some of the shifts, and we do have shifts running all the way to 9 p.m., which is in, in effect now until about mid-April. We will be assisting at the spring training uh, games, and uh, we'll have volunteers at the information kiosk there. Our 33rd annual Volunteer Tourism Ambassador Luncheon is uh, scheduled for April 12th, and you will all receive your invitations for it. Hope you can all uh, join us on that. Uh, our volunteers are out on familiarization tours. Actually, just yesterday, they were at Home with Suites uh, in Benita, as well as the Wonder Gardens. Next week, they'll be at Sun Harvest and Hammond Stadium. We also have Correction State Park and Spring Hill Suites Estero coming up, as well as uh, Pure Florida is taking them on a sightseeing uh, cruise in early February. So big thank you to all of our partners who are hosting our volunteers. We greatly appreciate that. And that's it from me. Are there any questions? See, I knew it was short and sweet. <laughs> Thank you, Simone. And again, apologies to Simone. Now that concludes my report uh, for the January TBC meeting. Very good. Do we have any for council information this morning, too? There is a, a copy uh, in your packet of the winter edition of uh, MMGY's Portrait of the American Traveler. Uh, uh, some of those questions are specific to our area, so I encourage you, um, you know, to uh, peruse that. I, I realize that uh, you know data collection right now is a little interesting for our area, but it's still good information to know what's going on out there. Very good. Council, any questions? Okay. I know this has, uh, yeah, right? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, when you look at the awareness of Fort Myers compared to last year, um, what slide, this is page nine, it mentions some specific areas. We have Fort Myers, Fort Myers Beach, Sanibel, Captiva. Um, there's no mention of the Cape, and I was wondering if that's possible, something we, in the future to possibly ask, or, is that, or are they open-ended questions? I believe it's an open-ended question, but I will find the answer to that out for you. Of the, sea, the Cape now, Cape Pine Island, that, that? Yep, understood. Thank you. Very good. What other questions do we have? Any other questions about the study? Appreciate that. Um, all right, very good. So that concludes for council information and our executive director report. Uh, at this time, we'll go to TBC member items. Uh, Ms. Cronin, would you like to kick us off? For a little shameless self-promotion, we have our largest event of the year coming up, February 5th. It's our gumbo fest where we bring in the Zydeco band and, and you know, all the entertainment from New Orleans. And um, this year, more than ever, it's, uh, it's a fundraiser for the Nature Park. And, we, as everyone else did, had quite a lot of devastation. We were extremely fortunate. All of our animals were safe, all of our staff were safe, um, their families were safe, so that was great. But we did have some sort of destruction to almost every habitat and the landscaping was destroyed. So we have a lot of work to do in the nature park. We've got it cleaned up. The whole property is back open, so we're very happy about that. But um, this year, the, the uh, Gumbo Fest will be really important to us, and, and plus it's time for Let's celebrate. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Cronin. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Just real quick, I want to talk about one of our neighbors on Pine Island Road, Gator uh, Mites, has opened up their Dinosaur Falls mini golf, which is actually really cool. If you have kids, they'll absolutely love it. Uh, so there's a working volcano that was built by the same people that did Rainforest Cafe uh, that goes off about every 30 minutes. And there's animatronics in the in the nine dinosaurs that are around the course. So it is fun for younger kids and older. And young at heart. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Mary Smith, anything this morning? Um, yes, I you know I'm 
I think our city manager did an excellent job talking about what's happened, where we are, what we're looking forward to. I just kind of wanted to pick up on that as in regards to tourism. Um, a lot of what we are doing, we understand what the city of Sanibel is, uh, not only as a community and our home, but also what it brings to Southwest Florida in regards to our economy and, uh, and our tourism. So I want to let everybody know, you know, when we lifted those past restrictions, we do have some businesses um, that are open, uh, as open as they can be, and it's a much different open, but we certainly encourage everyone to come in and help those businesses um, to hold on because it's going to be a long road ahead, but we know we're going to do it. And also we passed right through from Sanibel to Captiva. We're certainly, I'll, I'll let Tony speak to that. Um, but we are looking forward to saying, you know what? Come and do what you can. Come and see what we are. We know you love us, and we want you to continue to love us, and so support us in our needs right now. And I'm so appreciative how everyone is so respecting what we ask. You know, there's a lot of devastation out there, um, and people are getting back to their homes and trying to work on those. And, and I want to thank everyone that's coming over and really staying within those boundaries. It says a lot about... Um, of everyone's character to just say, you know what, we understand, we hear you, we want to come support you, but we're going to stay in the lane that we know you need us to right now. Um, volunteerism, so as we lift those as we lift those restrictions for those passes, we have had so many people that are calling to say, can we volunteer? There are opportunities that you can look for through SCCF, Ding Darling. Um, possibly we can coordinate at some point with the VCB to say, you know what, let's have a Sanibel Day, let's have a Fort Myers Beach Day and get out there and work together as a community. Because like you said, we're going to be doing this together and what we are going to be, what we are right now and going to become is going to be absolutely magnificent. Uh, fishing is amazing. So anyone that, that does get out on the boats, they, they you know, imply that in some of the showcase here. And the fishing is good, it's strong, be careful out there. But thank you to everybody for you know, being a part of the team of, of what we are, because really we, we are a greater team and Sanibel certainly re appreciates that. Very good. Yeah, Director Pigott. Uh, Mayor, I just wanted to add, I know some VCB staff are signed up for a beach cleanup on Sanibel this weekend, so you might see some folks out there. Thank you. Um, and, you know, we've been we've been very respectful of, of Sanibel's messaging, but, uh, you know, uh, I think that that announcement about the beach is opening in February. I think your restaurateurs are going to uh, benefit significantly once the folks can come out and go to the beach. Um, as you as you know, uh, people are staying. People who want to be here and are passionate about this area are staying at inland hotels, um, but they do want to put their toes in that sand. And um, I think you know, obviously, some of them are visiting our friends in Naples and going to Boca Grande as well. But I, I know they will be grateful to have that opportunity to come back and, and, and enjoy Sanibel. Um, but but know that you know we're, when you're ready, we're ready. We're, we've been standing on ready. And uh, we're, 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 not to worry, we're going to go. <laughs> I just wanted to, you know, to let everyone know, we realize that we're working diligently as the chair came out. We talked about the beaches because we understand those beaches are world loved and we want to get people back there loving them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, very good. Well, thank you. Um, Mr. Lappy. Yeah, just a bit of information, I thought, for some people may or may not know it. Um, I was at the Captiva Twelve foot surge, but on top of that, which a lot of people I didn't realize, there was an eight foot wave action, which actually on the toll booth, which is up in the air, penetrated that up in there, and they had to have all the drywall replaced. I was unaware of that that it was that high. Uh, secondly, uh, their design in the causeway, what they're doing now, is basically based on the storm that we went through. So. As this causeway gets rebuilt, it is built to standard to withstand this new type of storm, and they project that it should be done by 2023, the end of 2023. So I thought that was all great information, and also the islands may be raised another two feet to take care of any sea level rise in the future. So just for your information, I thought that was 
you know, I don't listen to a whole lot of things at these meetings, you know, but I did listen to that very carefully. So anyway, just so you know, thank you. Uh, very good inside information. They haven't even told the commissioners about that <laughs> stuff yet. So we'd love to hear about that too. Um, Mr. Wells. I, I thought that the Sanibel update was, you know, fantastic, really well uh, done and appreciate the efforts put towards uh, informing us here of the progress that's been made there. Also, it may be um, an idea that, that, that we reach out to our county officials, maybe do the same kind of thing from a broader Lee County perspective uh, at an upcoming meeting, just so that uh, the information is passing through to council and then, and then on to, uh, to interested parties. So a, a thought to maybe that's our, everybody's looking for a, um, a purpose, I guess, after events like this, and there's been a lot of questions as to what the First Development Council's role in all of this would be. Um, one of the easy ones, I think, would be a, a format where people can come together, share their stories of success and best practices uh, on the recovery efforts. Yeah, very good. Any comment on that? Yeah. Rob, I'll have that conversation with uh, Chris Brady. She couldn't join us today, a little under the weather, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that and see if we can't start to roll some folks in here talk about their efforts. Believe me, they're, go they're going on, <laughs> as I know you're aware, but... Um, I love nothing more than volunteering to do things like this. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Wells. Uh, Councilman Feisel. Yeah, I'd like to <clears throat> wish everybody a belated happy New Year. It's the first time we've been together in the, in the new year. Um, I had an opportunity uh, to go north for the holidays uh, the same instant that we landed at the airport, the storm hit the city of Indianapolis. It was 11 degrees below the next morning. And I quickly realized why so many families are moving to southwest Florida each day to get away from that particular kind of weather. Um, the village of Estero is doing quite well right now, comparatively speaking. We are making our last uh, sweep through the village to pick up debris. The collection site at 41 and Coconut will soon be vacant. It's, we're moving it off at a rapid pace, hopefully by the end of, um, at least the end of February, it may be sooner, will be cleaned up and um, back to looking like we did before the storm. Not so, not so fortunate for all the residents that were affected, but we're in the process, but overall, we're doing quite well. Very good. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Mr. Kramer. Uh, just anecdotally for the hotel and how we're doing, we're continuing to rebuild at the Hyatt. We've got still two pool decks closed. We still have our beach closed. We still have our outdoor restaurant that was underwater that's closed. So we've got a lot that we're rebuilding. But the stuff that has been rebuilt looks better than it ever has. It's all brand new. Everything is brand new. Uh, that's the other side of the storm. That's the positive spin, right, is that you start fresh. Um, and the good news is that uh, while we anticipated through the first quarter, which was going to be extremely strong for us pre-storm for group business into the hotel. We, we expected that we would lose at least 50% of that business due to the area not having as much to do, due to not having as many amenities open. Um, I've lost less than 10% of that business. They've all come out, they've all looked at the property, they've all looked around, they've all decided that they're gonna continue to, to come, to, to stay, and um, not only are they coming and staying, but they're actually increasing their blocks, so their numbers are going up. So it's a good sign, hopefully, for the future that uh, the news is fading out and memories are short and people are gonna come back and, and stay in our beautiful county. We believe that. Absolutely, Excellent. thank you, Mr. Kramer, great report. And uh, Councilman Sankey. Well, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to participate. I appreciate the, the appointment uh, before the end of the year, uh, and uh, it's an honor to be here, and I hope I can um, supply perspective uh, that brings benefit to the entire county but certainly uh, Cape Coral based. Uh, and so uh, I, would, I, I can't uh, overemphasize how uh, important and pleased uh, that I am that uh, we are promoting that we are still open for business. Uh, the the uh, you know, national media just, uh, t it tends that uh, uh, bad news is more popular than good news. And the good news is, is that we still have a lot of things that uh, our visitors can participate in 
uh, and I'm, I'm glad to see that we're promoting uh, that we are we are still alive and well, and there's reason to be here as, as people um, become creatures of habit. Um, uh, the, their habit was to come here. We don't want to change that habit and to make sure that they all know that there's still reason to come instead of try someplace else is, is so important. So I'm glad to see that we're doing that. Um, uh, to tag on to uh, Jay's comments about Gator Mike's, uh, other than just uh, for the youth, uh, he's also developed a, a, an interesting uh, ropes course uh, that many um, uh, you know, businesses and, and organizations use for, for team building. Uh, and so to bring people into our, our county that, that uh, would bring their organizations here, uh, there's an actual opportunity uh, that, that we might want to promote uh, for, for those organizations to develop their teams uh, here and have their teams exposed uh, to our area and at the same time have a place that, to have their family that's visiting with them uh, have some fun while they're participating in their corporate event. Uh, and uh, this weekend, uh, come one, come all, uh, uh, our CAPES, uh, one of our CAPES banner events uh, for the year is our, is our art festival uh, this weekend. So uh, come enjoy all the, uh, uh, the local uh, art that you'll see displayed there. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be great to have uh, some of the, the new pieces for Fort Myers uh, Beach and the island uh, to be there. But uh, uh, that was my report for this month. Beautiful. Thank you, Councilman. And I got to tell you, you know, speaking as a CAPE native, if you have not been down Pine Island Road lately, there's a lot of new businesses, a lot of new restaurants, a lot of new exciting things to do in Cape Coral. Avoid it between 5 and 6.30. <laughs> like, you know, that's not the best time. But other than that, go down that road and, uh, and check out all the new restaurants and new things we have to do in Cape Coral. And of course, if you're a foodie, South Cape is the place to be. Absolutely. And apartment buildings, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, Chiquita, uh, along Chiquita and along Pine Island Road, amazing. Much needed in our area, so good news for the community. Uh, the growth is amazing now. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, very good. Is there any further business before us then? No, sir. All right, seeing no further business, then we are adjourned. Thank you, Council. Good day, gentlemen. It's great to be too. Thanks. Yeah, we're, it's going to be a It's not a sprint. <laughs> it's not a sprint. <laughs>